There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. First of all, our Out of the Cities webinar from last year. Uh, it's important to have this one seen and viewed in addition to the one this week. This lays more of a spiritual foundation, and we get into the how, the why, the what, the where, and the who, and all those things with this one. It's critically important, I believe, to see both. And when you see them both kind of melded together, you'll get a better understanding, a full understanding of the country living out of the city's picture. Number two, obviously, this needs no mention, Country Living. You have to read this book. This is essential. There's no option, you have to read it. Country Living by Ellen G. White. It's a compilation, but it's very well put together. I mentioned before, some of the compilations we see coming out of you know, Maryland are a little shaky. This is powerful, very, very powerful. So Country Living, please prayerfully and slowly and prayerfully read it and reread it and read it again and read it one more time, amen. <laughs> From City to Country Living, this one was written by Sister White's son, Arthur L. White, and also E.A. Sutherland. E.A. Sutherland, one of the pioneers. This is a companion book, actually, to uh, Country Living. So this one should not be read without Country Living. Are you with me? Very important, very, very good book. Extremely well, well written. Next book, you didn't know we were in school, did you? Amen. Well, moving to the country is an education. Amen. It's an education. Like I've mentioned before, your entire life experience, your entire life philosophy has to be altered. You have much to learn, but many, many things to what? To unlearn. To unlearn. Sustainable Preparedness, written by Brother Craig Meisner and his wife and his son. Amen. This is a must read. Very practical, extremely practical. You have to read this one too. This has to be in your country living library. Sustainable preparedness. They're actually getting ready to give a, a, a series of meetings in Southern California, him and his wife. Actually, next month. Next month. There's another book I want to recommend I don't have with me. Sister Betty Franklin recommended me to recommend it to you. It's a book written by Jerry Franklin. Uh, it's called You Can Survive. You Can Survive. Highly recommended book. It's a little thicker than these. It's actually probably bigger than all three of these together. But it's more, from what I understand, on the spiritual side of things. And uh, I, I highly trust Sister Betty's opinion, and so I'm recommending, recommending it to you. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So our first presenter this afternoon, or the, the head of the household just walked out. Maybe, okay, okay. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Okay. So we're gonna be presenting, I'm gonna discuss this, I might give a little testimony after this first presentation. Uh, we have a lot of plans for the rest of this year and next year and beyond, depending on how much co time the Lord allows us to have. But this webinar, we believe, we believe we just scratched the surface. We really do. And there's a big work to be done to help God's people to stand true to Him. So what we want to do is do webinars. They may not necessarily all be a whole week. Some may be one day. We might put an announcement out on the channel and tell you we're having a webinar coming up in a few days. We might do a three-day weekend webinar. We might do a Saturday night crash webinar. We just have a lot of things that we're planning that we're having development right now. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the reason why we're gonna be giving all these webinars when I give my little testimony a little bit later on. Amen? So I'm gonna go to the Bible. We're still waiting for our sister to get mic'd up. This is kind of a carryover from last night. Turn with me if you can to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19. 
just a friendly, gentle, loving reminder to all the husbands out there who aren't quite on board with their wives as far as leaving the city. Genesis 19. And I'm going to pick up at verse 15. Genesis 19, 15. The Bible says, And when the morning arose, and we all know the story. This is the story of Lot leaving the city, right? Leaving Sodom. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot. So was it an urgent matter to get him out of the city, yes or no? Yes. It was urgent, very urgent. They hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife. Take thy what? Thy take thy wife. So he wasn't to go alone. He was supposed to take his family with him, right? Yes. Him and his household, yes. Taking charge. Now, he had his reasons for hesitating. We're told by Sister White that he had a what kind of spirit? Lingering spirit. Lingering spirit. Brother Marcus and I had a nice conversation last night about the reasons my, why he might have had that spirit. Part of it, I'm sure, was the fact that his family was still there. He had two daughters that obviously married two men that were in the world, so they were heavily influenced by the, the, the environment of, of, uh, of, of Sodom. But he still loved them, as many of us do who have children who are in the world. I have two grown children that are still in L.A., languishing in the world. And we're praying every day for their salvation. I'm not even concerned right now about the country. I want you to be saved. I want you to be saved. Take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the country, of the city, of the city. So the Lord's barrage of weapons were pointed where? At the big city. He was going to rain fire and brimstone down, not on the rolling country, gentle hills out there, but on the major city, the big city. 16, and while he what? Lingered, while he lingered. Doesn't matter why, why he lingered, he lingered, he lingered. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. Let me ask you a question. Based on the fact that they were young ladies, we know they were young because for the most part, well, we know they were living in his household still. They were still living there. So they didn't really didn't have much of a choice, did they? I have to eat. My, my father's in authority. I have to go where he says go, right? So they took the two daughters by the hand as well, the Lord being merciful unto him. In other words, Lot, we know you love your family. We know you're a just man. You're the only man of God in this entire city, the only one. We want you to be with your family. We're going to keep your sacred circle and your family as a whole together. So we're going to take you all out. Being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without or outside the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. This is the angel talking now. Escape for thy life. What are the orders that he gave Lot and his family? Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So the angel saying two, thing there, two things there. Number one, I know there's a lot of things in the city you love. You've been there for many, many years. But you have to let go now. You got to let go. It's time to, to disattach yourself, if that's even a word. You know how when you're, you're on to take a flight somewhere and the plane lands and they say it's time to deplane? Well, they needed to de-city, right? They need to de-city. So the angel's saying, let go. Don't look back, number one, but neither stay thou on all the plain because the Lord is saying, listen, I have to destroy the big city, but I have to also destroy the suburbs. Every single town that's associated with those cities. See, suburbs don't just happen. People flock from the city and they make suburbs. That's what suburbs consist of, people that were in the city. So Sister White brings out the fact that the iniquity, the same element of crime, et cetera, still exists in those little towns. It's no different. A, a place I love to use an, as an example, and we have some residents here, no offense intended, but a town I love to use as an example is Jackson, Tennessee. Jackson, Tennessee's crime is off the charts. This is a city of 65, 67, 68,000 people. The crime rate index is through the roof. The intensity of crime, the ratio of crime there is bigger, much bigger than L.A. or New York. It's intense. But that 
capsulizes to me what the angel's talking about here. Don't go there. So of course, Lot wanted to go to the small town. He wanted to go to Zoar, the suburb, as it were, the suburb of, of, of Sodom. Why did he want to go there? I believe he didn't want to be too far from his family. It wasn't that he wanted to be in a small town because he still wanted city life. He believed the angel, but wouldn't you do the same thing? I don't want to be a thousand miles from my family, right? But he learned a lesson, didn't he? Because when he saw that the Lord meant what he said, and he means the same thing today in our time, thousands of cities are going to be what? Destroyed. Thousands. Inhabited islands are going to be what? Swept away. Coastal cities are going to be what? Drowned underwater. So God says what he means, and he means what he says. So when he told him he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw it actually happen when fire and brimstone came raining down from heaven, then he came to his senses, didn't he? Oh, you know what? I better get up and get out of here. The Lord meant what he said. Same thing in our day to day. This is an exact perfect picture, a symbol, a type of what's going to happen in our day. We believe in the very near future. So we have to get out. Amen? What happens here? Help me. Okay. So I'm going to read one more vo a verse or two before we get started as soon as he comes back. So verse 18 says, And Lot said unto them, O oh, no, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and die. Making excuses. How many of us in the cities make excuses today? Many, many people. Now, I know there are many people that don't make excuses. My wife and I are an example. The Lord said, get out. We said, okay. Took a while, but we by faith stepped out, stepped out on faith. It's time to go. So this, I want to read these last few verses before we continue. I'm going to go down to verse 31. Now, this, this, these verses here are, are really amazing to me. They're eye-opening. This kind of sheds light on the corruption and the influence of living in a major city. And it still happens today. A city now is no different than a city back then. And the firstborn said unto the younger, the daughters, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. The second daughter repeated the same. Now, they had to have some serious exposure to a serious, corrupt, vile environment. Probably witnessed it firsthand or had some neighbors or some girls down the way or at school, at the local high school or somewhere, to have that even enter into their thought process. How can that even enter their mind that they would do something so vile like that? How could it enter into anybody's mind? But brother, sister, brother, sister. In Leviticus 18, verse, 20 through, verse 23, didn't the Lord warn the Israelites? He told them that man shall not lie with a beast, that a woman shall not stand before a beast to lie with him. Didn't he warn them of that? So what does that tell you? It was happening everywhere else anyway. I'm warning you, my children that I love, so that you won't get caught up in that same nonsense too. So this world is a filthy place. What you see on the news is nothing, not even scratching the surface, not even entry level. You get a chance to ride, ride around in a police car, a squad car, all day long in a big city somewhere, and just listen to the calls that come in, you wouldn't believe your ears. What they allow you to see on the news is nothing. It's a much worse place than people believe. People are deceived. So my prayer is that all of you that are within the sound of my voice make haste through prayer first, of course, to leave these wicked cities. Amen. Amen. So I want to introduce our esteemed guest this afternoon. Brother and Sister Rim, would you please come forward? And I'm going to ask for your flash drive, Sister Rim. Thank you, ma'am. I want to put it in over here. I'm going to set you up real, really, really quick. Come on for you guys are mic'd up, right? Okay, so this is Brother Thomas and Sister Jasmine Rim. Their ministry, as we talked about a little while ago, is outdoor education. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be feedback from you and I. Yeah. Um, I. I will humbly say that my eyes have been opened since I first saw them present at the Little Country Church out here about a year ago and had a chance to see their presentation then. 
And then the nature walk we took, which will air tomorrow morning and evening, it will repeat 8 a.m. and 7 p.m., was a stark reminder to me that God can, as he says through the prophets, set a table for us in the, in the wilderness. But she goes on to say they won't, the details of that won't be fully understood until the future. And I believe the future is right now. There's food out there without you even going a garden. But do you know what that food is? If we're on the move, which we who are faithful will be at some point on the run, on the move, will we know what to eat? They're going to show us by God's grace. Let me set them up. Give me a second. Is this it? Okay. Amen. So you can use my little humble little clicker here if you like. It's already up, down. Very simple. Okay. Don't push the, the big one. That's a big green laser. It might hurt you. No, God is good. So God be with you guys. God bless you. Oh. Moving from, from the city into the country, I'd like to share with you, or we'd like to share with you, before we get started, a uh, word of prayer first, and then I'm going to take you to the book of Genesis. So if you would, just bow your heads. Heavenly Father and loving Lord, we want to thank you as we ask for your spirit to continually uh, teach and guide and direct our path. Uh, bless the ministries here. Bless all that is... Uh, being done to warn or encourage your people and to invite others to learn more and more about you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Genesis 1, the first chapter, and verses um, 11 through 12. Genesis 1, verses 11 through 12. And what does it say? Read it. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. The reason why we continue to bring you back to the Word of God is because so often we're in a society now that's prepackaged, everything moves quickly, nobody looks at the grass anymore like they used to, except to cut it. Uh, you've been cutting your food for years and not realizing it. We, um, my wife and I, we sometimes chuckle when we see information about people, well, we're not laughing at the dead people, okay? We're laughing at the fact that these people were struggling in the woods trying to find food. They were walking on it, falling on it, and eventually they died on it. And the food was right there. But then... We're reminded, God says that for his people, what happens? We perish for the lack of. We should have been Sabbath after Sabbath learning what God has created and made. Now, when you read Genesis 1, verses 11 through 10, you'll realize that God made all the herbs. He made all the grasses, right? He made everything. If you turn to 29, what does it say in verse 29? You read it for yourself. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, 
I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So God has provided us with food. Now, since Noah and the flood, uh, we've been eating what kind of diet? And we kind of left the greens alone. Uh, the reason why I say that is because we've been running into a lot of people who are still eating flesh, maybe not this group, but they refuse to eat any greens. And it's, it's hard to understand that, wait a minute, okay, that was in addition to your diet, and people would rather stay with uh, the addition, and they refuse to go back to the original. Well, this, we're not here to condemn you. However you feel you need to come about it, that's on you. But uh, as we look at the news, we hear information constantly how the meats are being tampered with, uh, what the animals are being fed is not something you would feed even your most harsh enemy. So it's time to think about your diet. Like to kind of share with you how we got started um, with this wild edible uh, introduction. This was something that the Lord put on my heart as a teenager, um, 15, 16 years ago, uh, 15, 16 years old. I was, um, I wish it was. I did not rob the cradle. <laughs> totally. But anyways, um, when I was about 15 or 16, I, the Lord impressed me as a young teen to start learning about edible plants on my own. And back then, I thought it was my own personal hobby. So I just, you know, would just go in my backyard. And I'm originally from Wisconsin. And so, you know, the weather up there is cold. So the seasons were not like down here where you can study and really see lots of plants almost all year long. But I started just in my backyard, and the very first plant I discovered was the dandelion. And from there, whenever we had like a church picnic, in my schoolyard, any place there was a little greenery, I was out there with my one little book that I had at the time, studying it, tasting it, you know, and, and whatever else information I could find on it. Uh, I did that for about 10 years when I was in Wisconsin, moved to uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and I kid you not, within one week, I met my husband-to-be. <laughs> that was totally the Lord because prior to that, I remember, and I didn't go to college until I was like 24. And um, when I was 19, I remember someone telling me, go to Oakwood, find a husband. And I was like, I'm not going all the way down there spending all that money, you know, just to find a husband. Well, within a week of me getting there, I met who was to be my husband. Within three years, we were married. But the inter interesting thing is um, I just shared with him bits and pieces, you know, about edible plants and so forth. And interestingly, he, he, he just loved it just like I did and found out we both loved the outdoors. And uh, our first hike was literally hiking up a mountain and um, back down a mountain and not on a trail. I took him totally off the trail and realized that he was the one I needed. <laughs> and I he, passed her test. Yeah, he passed my test. <laughs> After um, we found out we both loved the same things, we started working with Pathfinders, which is similar to uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and we started working with them as um, first as counselors, then we were directors, and then eventually we became um, Coordinate. conference coordinators for South Central Conference. And while we were, we became master guys together also. While we were master guys, we were teaching a 10 hour weekend workshop, master guy workshop. And we decided for the first time to just kind of throw out the ideal of wild edible plants to our people wondering if, if they would like it, seeing how they would take it. And at the time, we were right in the uh, science complex at Oakwood University. We had a group about this size, about 30 or so. And I, I literally, they saw me go outside with nothing in my hand, come back in with a big bowl, uh, you know, those big stainless steel bowls of grass, clover, sour grass, um, wild onions, just a whole bunch of stuff I found right outside the uh, complex and came in, basically put it in uh, some water with a little salt, that was it, and boiled it for maybe 
10, 10 or minutes. 15 minutes yeah. and then invited them to come and taste it. And as it was silent for a while, nobody made a move. Finally, but here was the key. On our side, they had been there all morning, so they were hungry. Yeah, that's the key. And one person came down. They watched her fill her bowl. They watched her go back. And you had all these people watching her as she's taking a spoonful of food. And they noticed she didn't cough. die, cough. <laughs> she didn't roll okay. over. Yeah. Yeah. Bowl did not drop out of her lap. So one by one, they came down, and as they tasted it, the reviews were excellent. There's meat in this pot. <laughs> and uh, they couldn't believe it, and um, the pot was empty. So I don't yeah. think we got any. We, uh, they literally emptied the pot out. And as a result of that, um, that was in November of 1991. When they saw what I did and, and saw how well it tasted, their questions were, how can we learn more about this? How can we learn about wild edible plants? Now, my husband and I have been throwing around doing a wilderness survival type program, which would introduce that as well. And so that was November of 1991. By January of 1992, we had started the wilderness survival camping program, which was a four-phase four program. And we would do it then. We started off every about... Uh, every every season, pretty much every season. And what we would do is take groups, and these groups were coming from everywhere. Uh, we even had a couple come from Chicago. But they would come to a central location um, in the National Forest or State Park, always in the primitive section. And we would do a, a weekend program. Now, we did it in four phases, meaning at phase one, we would let them bring whatever they felt comfortable, comfortable. with. Okay? Outside of electrical you know, Devices, back then there were yeah. Walkmans. We don't have that now, but they couldn't bring any of that. No TVs, though people did ask. And uh, by Especially phase, around the games. Yes. By phase two, we were saying, okay, leave this behind, leave that. By phases three and four, they didn't even have tents. They just slept under the canopy of the sky. And we taught them in phases one and two different camping skills. We taught about edible plants. We taught about medicinal plants. Then by phase four, we just used a lean-to made out of the trees and the leaves and the branches uh, in the wild. And uh, each phase built on the previous. So by the end of phase four, they were ready to just go out on their own. This we did for about um, six, six years. Six, seven years. Six, seven years. And, uh, you know, we were going to state parks and um, uh, national forests and wasn't quite what we needed. So we began to pray. And in my mind, uh, being the Christian that loves the Lord that I am, I just knew the Lord was going to answer that in just a few months. Well, two years later, <laughs> we still weren't on our little land. took me through a spiritual change which could not have um, happened any other way. He changed me from the inside out, actually did a flip in my mind. And I'm, I've been in the church forever. I never even left the church. But the Lord had to show me through that prayer, through those experiences that we went through, the two years of praying and, and so forth, that um, he loved me, that I could trust him, and that he had a place for us. Even though it looked like everything we had we get it, and at the last minute, it would be pulled out from under us. For instance, we started off with three acres and a house, and it fell through. So then I figured the Lord wanted us to ask for more. So I asked for five. You did. And it fell through. So I said, okay. Well, we got the five. Yeah, we did get the five. Uh-huh. 
and it fell through. <laughs> At the last minute. So I said, okay, Lord, you obviously you want us to ask for more. So we went up to 10. Now let me add this. While he was praying this prayer, I was not with him. I mean, physically I was there, but mentally, spiritually, I was just looking at him like, okay, if that's what you want to pray, I'm not going to stop you, but I'm not praying that. Just letting you know where I was. I was urged, urged on. Uh, it came through. We knew the people who had the 10 acres of land. They were selling it, and the last minute, it fell through. So we said, wait a minute, something must be going wrong. So we said, let's go to the bank and that we bank at, and we're going to talk to the bank president and see what we can do. So we walked in. We sat down. He was on the phone with his mother. His mother had done what? <laughs> She had uh, spent all the money in her account, and she was overdrawn. And the way he was talking to her, we said, oh, surely the Lord is going to bless us now. If we're here witnessing him tweaking the books for his mom, quite naturally, he's going to look out for us. He got off the phone and said, I can't help you. And we looked at each other. We said, okay. Uh, is this something we're not doing? Do we look strange? Or, you know, the thing is, he never even looked at our account. Our yeah, he didn't. Anything. He just got off the phone and said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And that happened like three times after going to the bank. And finally, we were like, are we dressing wrong? <laughs> I mean, we are trying to look, you know, don't go in looking bummy. But, you know, is something wrong? with? Because most of the people, the, the bank presidents or whoever we spoke to, loan officers, before we could get it halfway out of our mouth, they would just say, we can't help you. I had a good job. <laughs> it wasn't like I didn't have a job. Wasn't asking for welfare or anything, but I was. I figured, you know, hey, make pretty good money. So, uh, it didn't work. So my husband, after asking for 10, he said, I'm asking for 20. It came and left. And I was hurt. And I said, Lord, okay. If you want us to have some land, that night we prayed. I said, tomorrow, you send somebody to me who say we, that we should be on your land, on his land. And it has to be 30 acres. At lunchtime, a man walked up to me and said, you need to be on my land, and it's 30 acres. <laughs> Let me verify. He called me and told me. Yes. So, I, yeah. So I walked the land with him. We walked the land. Everything was in agreement. And the man said, well, look, I'm not going to sell it to you, but I'm going to let you lease it. And I said, fine, we can lease it for 10 years. It's 30 acres of land. And it has two ponds and it's great. It's got a forest. We can really camp out here and do a lot of stuff. So we said there's no building on the place. Do you mind if we move a trailer on? He says, no, you do whatever you need. So we got approved for a trailer. We had everything set up, ready to go. And then we had the lawyer draw it up because we wanted to be right. We said, we're only loose leasing this for 10 years. I asked him, uh, well, how much do you want? He says, just pay the taxes. Well, guess what? The taxes was less than $100 a year. So we knew we were on it. And uh, so we called the man two days later, and he didn't answer the phone. And the fourth, fifth time I called, his wife says, I notice you've been calling this, this number for the last several days. How can I help you? I said, well, your husband and I, we're in agreement on leasing some land. And she broke out in a laugh. And when she started laughing, I said, not again. I knew what that meant. It wasn't going to happen. The man accused us of forcing him to give us his land. And I looked at my wife and I said, do we look like the mafia? <laughs> Couldn't understand it. So we let it go. And I said, Lord, I lost 30. You're going to have to do better. 50. Yes. 50 came. Now, let me tell you where I was at this time, mentally and spiritually. 
by this time, and this was like the fifth house that mm -hmm. we had literally almost had in our hand, and at the last minute, literally, and you know how the enemy puts thoughts in your head, and unfortunately, I was listening to some, not realizing it was the enemy. I really thought they were my thoughts, but nonetheless, things that um, I was hearing was, if I were the Lord, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't let you get so close and then snatch it out like that. And as I listened to those words in, in, in my head, I began to see, yeah, that's you. God, that, God, oh, he's not. And I began to, and I'm just speaking the truth because I'm not the only one that thinks those thoughts. I know that. I've talked to some people, and I know. And, uh, but for many, many weeks, I, you know, I told my husband, I said, I'm not going back to any bank. I'm not going to even pray with you about it. I'm not going to speak against you, but my whole spiritual, I thought I was a strong Christian, but that experience, which lasted about a year or so, it brought did. me down to a point of almost giving up on the Lord. Because as I listened to those lies, I realized now they were lies from the enemy in my head, I began to actually put what is true about the enemy on God. Just being real honest here. And as I began to do that subtly, I wasn't really verbalizing it, but in the back of my head, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, if he really loved me, he wouldn't do that. And so I really kind of quit praying and just was there, just physically. If he told me something, I'm like, okay, you know, go ahead and then I'll tell you the rest. <laughs> well, we're telling you this because we want you to move to the country if you haven't moved there. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. The devil doesn't want you to be successful in trusting God. God wants to bless you, but too often we fall short. Okay, now, I know you're saying the brother was insane anyway, going from three acres to 50. Well, let me tell you, the Lord was urging me on to ask for more. And at the same time, I had to pray for my wife and get her on board because the blessing was not going to take place unless the both of us was on board. So now, how do I convince a wife without twisting arm, threatening to get her on board when she's her own person? I mean, there's no way that I'm going to convince this lady here who you think is the mild quiet type, and you think that I am the aggressor? <laughs> Y'all just don't know. Anyway, all I'm saying is, you know, trying to help Mother Eve come along with, with Adam <laughs> was, was something, it, it, it took prayer. It took prayer and it took patience. I mean, unbelievable. And the Lord was supplying everything that we needed. To convince her was not my job. That was God's job. But the brother had said, you husbands who are not on board, but the wives are, it, the two of you have to be on board in order to make it. Okay, we saw what happened to Eve. I mean, what happened to Lot's wife. She didn't make it. She turned back. But it could have been Lot, and they could have kept going. So I'm just, we're just being real here. So from 50 acres of land, I said, Lord, 50 come and gone. I need 100 acres of land. Now I'm doubling because I know God is able, and he can do it. Now, at the same time, what, what she failed to tell you is we were still doing WSC. It was crazy. We were, we were still taking groups out to Arizona, and uh, we were still doing wilderness survival. At the same time, we're trying to get out of the city. But we had to keep going, because that's what the Lord had asked us to do. And though she was struggling with this, Internally, now, when we came to the group, they didn't know what was happening, but I did. And so it was, it was, how should I say, the Lord was increasing our prayer life 
And as a husband, he was really increasing my prayer life. And talk about wearing out your knees. Oh, yeah, for sure. Now, do we want to go to the Dothan experience? We want to tell about what the 100 acres. The 100 acres, <laughs> how should I put it? Well, before we went to, we did that one. Yeah. Um, after the 50 acres, we had told the Lord that we were so through with all of it. I mean, this was like months and months into this and, you know, having something and then having it snatched at the last minute wore uh, both of us out. Whoa, wore three of us out. Our poor realtor, the poor lady, <laughs> she, she would have, have stuff lined up. Uh, at one point, we had signed, the other person had signed, we went on vacation, we came back, and the person could not be found. <laughs> Again. Again. And what we were told was, when we finally caught up with the person, that we had threatened him to sign the paper. Now, I know I might look a little thuggish, a, a little. But my wife doesn't, <laughs> okay? And so I'm trying to figure out how we have threatened somebody to sell their own property. All I know is that the Lord must have been, whoever they saw, it was not us, okay? They must have saw the angel of the Lord tell them the sign or something. That's all I know. But it, that, that's the things that would happen. And after that, after that last one, which was a beautiful home and everything, brick house, it was just beautiful. We were just, both of us were through. And we said together, and we were on this together, that we were not going to look anymore. We were done. And that if the Lord wanted us in the country, he was going to have to just come, send someone to both of us, not just one, yep. and tell us that they had the place and so forth and so on. But it had to be more than 100 acres. It had to be 100 acres at least. And so for one year, you know, and we just giving you bits and pieces of the story, um, because it's, it's long, but for one year, we actually lived in an uh, apartment building and just kind of rested. It was like That's the Lord just cool. gave us a, a whole year to just relax from all of the stress and disappointment and so forth. And yes, it had a swimming pool that he went to and my, our son every, almost every, day. Every, every day or every week for certain. And we just, just rested. But before we went there, we, because that, uh, the 50 acres that we almost had, because we had literally signed uh, the paper and we went to Arizona, took a group of WSC uh, uh, participants to the Grand Canyon. When we came back, as my husband said, that's when we found out we couldn't find a guy. When we found him, he said we coerced him and all this. We had already told our landlord we were moving. And so we had to get out because we'd given him the, the notice and he had someone already coming to move into the house. So the situation was so stressful. I remember being at the home uh, one day and he was still working his regular job. And he, the landlord, no, no, not even the landlord, the people the who people. were supposed to move into our house came knocking on our door asking me, why are you still here? <sighs> Talk about stress. And I was like, well, the place that we were going to move, it suddenly changed and we got to find a place. So he says, well, you're holding up our family. And I was like, yeah, after he left, Lord, really? <laughs> you know, I'm like, Lord, you know, we don't want to discon inconvenience people. What are you doing? And uh, so we had to get out because the landlord said, you've already, you know, given your notice, et cetera. We got people moving. You got to get out. So we literally had to move now. He found uh, within a couple of days a friend one, of his. One night. One night. I called my supervisor and he told me, his brother was moving out of his house and moving into another house and that if I talked, if I go by there and ask him, we could probably move into his house that he was moving out of. So I grabbed my son because my wife wasn't going and we went to the place. It was at night. I looked at it. I said, well, I said something to my son that I think he probably laughed at me. It'll probably look better in the daytime. <laughs> You know what I meant. At night, it should have looked better. <laughs> anyway, so I said, don't tell your mom. Whatever you do, just don't tell your mom. So I got him back. I said, talk to the guy. He says, fine. As they were moving out, we were moving in. 
And when we pulled up, the wife seen it. I seen it in the daytime. When I walked in, you know, as a woman, a woman wants to know what the kitchen looks like. So I go to the kitchen and I see what I think are breadcrumbs until I get closer to them. They are rat droppings. And, you know, I told you how I was hearing this voice, which I didn't recognize it as the enemy, but in the back of my head, if I were God, I wouldn't do that to you. And I'm looking at the rat droppings, and I'm like, Lord, we just wanted three acres and a house, <laughs> you know. That's all we've been praying for. And so I turn around, and then I see what was my pet peeve going up and down the wall as if it was their house. And they were roaches. Now, what? I've lived where there's a roach here or there, you know. And, um, you know, that I didn't see them much. But they were going up and down, up and down, not just one, but several. And I see that, and I'm like, Lord, you said that if we ask for bread, you won't give us stone. I said, what is this? And then I said, Lord, I'd rather be in a tent outside than living in this. And that little did I know that they were worse than that. I opened the refrigerator, and they were all in there. I opened the microwave. And I'm, Lord, this is not even safe. Why would you do this? We just wanted three acres and a house. Tell them what was biting you. Oh, well, I didn't even know. I just know I'm walking through the house and I'm constantly doing this. I can't see them. Every now and then I see little black things, but I had no clue because I'd never, you know, experienced that. And my ankles, which, you know, I had, didn't have shoes on. I mean, I had shoes with no socks. And so I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And finally, about the third day, um, I see it and I tell someone, they say, oh, those are fleas. And I'm like, Lord? Big ones. Big fleas. Flat, you know. And I'm like, really, Lord? We just went in three acres and a house, and you put us in this? And so mentally and spiritually, I'm just going lower and lower and lower. And because of all the creatures in this house, I stay in one place in that house, on the couch. I did not go to the rooms. And at the time, we had our son, and we had a, a foster child. And um, we didn't even eat there, because when you tried to clean it, <laughs> I had a shampoo, a professional commercial shampoo that was given me. Her cousin and I, we washed the walls and we shampooed the rugs throughout the whole house three times. On the third time, I took the shampoo, I pushed it out on the street and left it. <laughs> That's how bad it was. Now, we, I, went, we had a dog, we wouldn't even bring him and put him in the house. Matter of fact, his doghouse might have been better than where we were. And I told the Lord that all the while, I was like, Lord, I wouldn't even put my dog in here. Why would you put us in this situation? We just wanted three acres and a house. And, after, and I wasn't with him cleaning because I, mentally I couldn't do anything. After I saw the rat droppings and the roaches and, you know, I, I couldn't help. I just was just trying to stay alive <laughs> mentally, okay? So he would go to work every day. And so, you know, I was homeschooled. So I was home with our boys. And uh, like I said, we didn't eat there. We'd go to Walmart. And uh, for a while, we would use the microwave that I brought in. But then about, mm, what, the, the, the second week, and I opened the microwave and... There was new little creatures in there. So obviously, okay, that's it. We're not eating here anymore. Go to Walmart, get some crackers, some chili, heat it somewhere else, and that's it. Now, slowly, yeah, okay. slowly, I was just giving up. I was done with the Lord, with praying, because I could not, in my mind, understand why he would allow us this. That's when I said, okay, Lord, obviously you brought us here for a reason. It's got to be. So I'd already figured out, Lord, if this is what you have to take us through in order to save us, then I'm willing to go through this to be saved. So I brought that information to my wife. I said, baby, if living here is what we have to do in order to be saved, wouldn't you want to do that? And she said a resounding... Ah, let me say what oh. I said. He forgot to tell you the scenario. 
I'm sitting on the one place I would in that house, the couch. Well, I, I didn't see that. Okay. He's sitting on a table or something. And um, then when he said that to me, he looked at me, you know, and it sounded really great, you know, th if this is what the Lord, where the Lord needs us in order to save us, I'm willing to do it. That's what he said. Then he says, aren't you? And I looked at him without hesitation and said, no. So knowing she did not hear me clearly, because I figure I, I probably said it a little bit too fast. I said, baby, you know, the Lord placed us here. And perhaps this, the reason why we're here. I'm going to need a fan. <laughs> Just thinking of the memories. <laughs> Is, is to save us. Aren't, I mean, wouldn't you want to do that to please God? His wife of how many years at that time? Uh, maybe 15, 15 years. years. Looked at him again and with clear thought. No, it was, it was ten? Two, two, uh, 10 years. 10 years. Because Nathan was only nine. Okay. 11. Looked at him with clear thought and again, I said, no. Now, what he did not realize, two things were happening. Remember my pet peeve, the roaches, which were just all over now? And I stayed in my one little position, just fearing that they were going to get me somehow. And see, I'm from the north, and in the north, anybody else out there from the north, just say yes. Okay, do cockroaches fly in the north? No. No. It was not till I came here in that house that I found out they fly. <laughs> and that morning, unbe unbeknownst to my husband, there was one behind me. And you know, they can be big down here. And I heard it. And I wasn't going to hit it with, you know, a shoe because I don't like to smush, but I, I went to get a tissue to, you know, throw it at it or something. And it flew towards me. And I almost lost it totally. I screamed and all that, and I was just done. I missed it, it, you know, it flew off, thankfully. So while he's telling me this, or asking me this, I'm thinking of that incident. Not only that, where he is sitting on the side of him, there's one going up and down, up and down. And so I hear him, but I'm watching the roach going up and down next to him. And in my mind, I'm like, there is no way. And so, I figured she needed some time to herself. <laughs> so I went into the garage where all our stuff happened to be. And there happened to have been a window that I could look into the living room. And so I positioned myself at that window in the garage, and I went to praying and asking the Lord to work this thing out. And my first prayer, I prayed. I looked up. Nope. Went back down to praying again. About the second time that I had uh, went down and prayed, when I got up, I looked, and I saw something different. My wife was. On my knees. And, you know, this was not even part of what we were going to share with you, but, you know, we everywhere before an audience, we pray and ask God to guide us. And he led us to share this because what happened in this uh, whole scenario was a life-changing thing for me, which I never, ever forgot and never will. But what had happened when he went out into the garage, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, we just wanted three acres in the house, <laughs> you know. Why would you put us in this? And this was really kind of my first time of calmly speaking to the Lord. And he said to me, he actually called my name, and he said to me, if I ask you to do something that you think you can't do, I will give you the strength if you just ask me. And it occurred to me, I had never asked him for strength to help me deal with this thing. I was just trying to use my whatever to, you know, survive these creatures and roaches and fleas. And we forgot about the big rat oh, yeah. that lived there. <laughs> and so when the Lord said that, he said, you never asked me to help you. And I was like, oh. And so by the time he looked the second time, that's when I decided to get on my knees. 
and through clenched teeth, but I said it. I said, Lord, if you want us to stay here in order to save us, I'm willing to do it. Again. And I got up off my knees really quick, just in case, you know, yeah. the creatures. Yeah. <laughs> well, I came in, we prayed again, and believe it or not, the very next day. We were out of there. Amen. Through no effort of our own. We thought because we had surrendered that whole situation to God that we were just going to have to hunker down and just live through this and he was going to somehow give me the strength to do it. But the next day our, my cousin came and she says, y'all need to be out of here. This is not livable. Come and live with us. We didn't hesitate. Packed up our little stuff. The one thing we were concerned was because there were so many roaches and stuff that, yeah, we did not bring one with us. And we lived with her for two weeks. Then the Lord led us to an apartment uh, complex. This is the one we said we lived for about a year and just rested. And when we got there, we didn't have a whole lot. You know, you got to pay a deposit and all. We didn't have that. But as we're walking, the lady is showing us the apartments. It's almost every few steps, she says, and we have a special just for today. Normally, the, the fee was, what, 500 right. And you put 500 down, another deposit, and the key deposit, and all that. By the time she was done, it was 600 something And she says, but today we have a special just for today. If you sign up, we uh, take off the, the uh, deposit. And put it towards something else. Yeah. And if you sign up today, you, we, you don't even have to pay the first month. And if you sign up, you don't, all you have to pay is $25. Oh. We were like, we got that. <laughs> We moved in, and for one year, literally, we were just kind of resting. God gave us the rest period. But what I learned through that, you know, like I said, we prayed the prayer. We just assumed that, you know, uh, in a few months, God was going to bless us with our little three acres in the house. And what he taught me is that we, and still teaching me, but in a way that I would never forget, no matter what you're going through, no matter how horrible it seems, one, don't listen to the enemy, okay? Two, God will help you through it if you ask him you know don't try and do it on your own you will fail every time mm -hmm. and the enemy is waiting there for you to just take you down and so we lived there for about a year yeah. and um that's when we had said we weren't looking no more we were done you know we did say 100 acres if something came but other than that we weren't even going to look and sure enough 120 acres came oh this one is funny we moved out of the area. Quit his I job. quit my job. We packed up the family and all our belongings and moved to the area. I acquired another job. We had a house, and uh, the 120 acres was available. I prayed on it every week. I would go by and just pray over it and say, thank the Lord for the 120 acres that we were about ready to build a camp. Guess what? <laughs> In less than 30 days. 30 days, we found out it was not available. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. I knew we were going in the right direction because the lady who owned the property, she had a blueprint of what she wanted on her campground. I had a blueprint that I made up it was almost identical to the amount of buildings, even to some of the names. It was just crazy. It was like the Lord was saying, no, you're in the right direction. What we didn't realize is that he had to take us this way in order to prepare us for what he had. Yes. Had we got the three acres in the house, we wouldn't have been able to move to the campground that they invited us to with a year later. Actually, it was within 10 months. Within 10 While months. While we were there, we, um, we were still under a lot of stress um, with the, the move and the, the person who had invited us there, he kind of uh, disappeared and all the promises he had made, the job and everything went um, south, south of the border. Of the and so we were just kind of in limbo and we were hunkering down because he had quit his job. We moved six hours away. What can you do except function, do the best you can. While we were there in that hunker down position, 
we had decided to quit doing wilderness survival camping because we figured, you know, we're in a position we can't really do it. We said that in the confines of our bedroom, there was no TV cameras, there was no radio. We thought there was nothing there that anybody else would be able to hear until we got this phone call two minutes after we had said, we're not going to do this anymore. And the first voice was a person that we knew with tears on in, in, their, in their voice. They begged us not to do what we had just planned to do. And that's when we looked around and said, how did she know? We didn't tell anyone. We've just talked among ourselves in the privacy of our bedroom. Who told her? We only had to conclude it was God. Had to then be. about an hour later, we got another call, this time from a, a guy who we used to be on our staff with Wilderness Survival, and he said the same thing. I don't know what decision you, ha you all have made, but it's a major decision. Don't do it. We were like, who told you? you know? <laughs> Again, we had to conclude that it was the Lord. And so we put it to the Lord. We put a fleece out, more, more, so to say. We said, okay, Lord, if you want us to do Wilderness Survival, uh, we're asking, we'll, we'll set a date, we'll put the word out. If we don't get at least seven, seven people, people, we're not going to do it. We'll take that as a sign from you that you don't want us to. Because in the past, we would average 40, 50 people or more sometimes uh, per weekend. And during Y2K, we had 125, okay? <laughs> you know why. <laughs> but we put that out there, and then the date came, and we waited to see who would come. We had 40-something people there. Now, the reason why we said seven, because we were in a different location, and we knew... <laughs> yeah, nobody if, was Nobody was going to show up. <laughs> out there. <laughs> 47 people showed up, and they were showing us stuff that was like uh, South Central had, had just brought some camp ground, and we're trying to get some land and these people got some land and what does that have to do with us nothing we really didn't want to hear about any more land and so the man was sticking the paper in my face and i kept saying i don't want to see it he kept saying read it read it, read it. i glanced it gave it to her her hat went down and she never saw it and um so then the question was wouldn't you want to camp there sure we camp anywhere no problem Two days later, I get a phone call from somebody who does not like me. And they asked me, you know, we just purchased some land, and would you like to camp with WSC? I said, sure, we camp anywhere. And they, I hung up. A couple of minutes later, he calls back. He says, well, the president said, uh, would you mind being the ranger out there? I said, I'm going to pray about it. Of course, now, he didn't see me. Uh, and so I hung up and my wife comes home and I told her about the phone call she says who oh this has got to be a joke he don't like you I said I know that but they asked me and they asked me to be the ranger and stuff like that she said South Central they don't do stuff like that she said okay I'll tell you what I'm going to ask the Lord for seven things. If they don't do these seven things, then we know it's not going to happen. To make a long story short, they did all seven of them, plus more. So the Lord confirmed he that confirmed this is it. where, and when we moved there on 570 acres. acres and lived there for 15 years, teaching wilderness survival, wild edible plants, and a host of other things, horse husbandry, pathfinder honors, just... White we water, pretty much had, had the lay of the land. Um, it was virgin wilderness, 90% um, uh, of it. We lived on maybe 15 acres that, that was much. developed, if that much. The rest was just virgin wilderness. And as someone who studied wild plants, you know that was heaven for me. Oh, yeah. I was out there every day, up in the woods, hiking the ridge, discovering more and more plants. And... Uh, all of it started coming together as I realized the enemy. God has something for us, all, for us all along. He knew we have to learn to trust God no matter what we're going through because he's got something way beyond what we could imagine 
We would never have asked for that much land. We wouldn't have asked for 50. We looked at our poor little budget, and that's why we were asking for three. But the Lord was like, I've got 500, 500 <laughs> plus acres for you, virgin wilderness, house, and everything is already there, and you can do what you love. And so we lived there 15 years. We just moved in 2012. 12. 12. And once we moved, you know, we still had the love of the wilderness, and I still had the information about edible plants. And we were like, Lord, how would you have us to do things now? Because it's still in our heads. What can we do? And initially, and we still do it, but initially the Lord had us going to preppers. And those are people who are preparing. They know something's coming, just like we know. But they're not looking at it from a spiritual. They're looking at it survival. They know how to protect themselves, but they don't know what to eat. And so the Lord put us in the place of one and then, you know, word of mouth. And we're going up in the backwoods of Tennessee, Alabama, where nothing is hardly, and teaching these people about wild plants and edible plants. And so as we started doing that, then other people started. And now this was that that was last year and year before slowly this year, just about every single weekend, we have been going somewhere. This is a passion. This is what we love. I live this. You know, when you ask God for something, don't think he forgot you. Mm -hmm. When we were dating, we made the mistake of saying we wanted to be missionaries. <laughs> and we were thinking Africa, India, someplace around all along, the Lord was showing us he wanted us here in this country to go along and do, but he had steps for us. Mm -hmm. So for 15 years, even though we were on a campground, we were learning more and more plants. And I mean, it, it was just, oh, it was just a joy. And then when it came to an end, we were saying, well, okay, we thought we were going to, the Lord has placed us in a whole different avenue now. Mm -hmm. Now we're going around, going from place to place, sharing with others that you can eat the food that, that's all around you. And it's free. Had we stayed on the campground, we wouldn't have met a lot of folk mm -hmm. unless they came to us. Now the Lord has prepared us that we can go out and meet other people, and we're, we're enjoying it. <laughs> um, one of the things that we like to share with people, number one, is that this food is free. Yes. And in most cases, I'd say 99% of the cases, it's in everyone's backyard. And if you don't have a backyard, you can go to someone else's backyard. <laughs> but, you know, all of these wild plants, and, and when I first started doing this as a teenager, I remember back then, they said there were over 300,000 plants. Now they're saying it's over 400,000. And they're not even talking the rainforest yet, which they're slowly cutting down. But of these 400,000 plants, about 370,000 are edible. And uh, a lot of people get a little concerned because they're like, but what about the poisonous? Do you know what percentage of these wild edible plants are poisonous? Less than 2%. So you really don't have to worry about it. And even those that are poisonous, it's not like they're going to kill you dead. They may give you an upset stomach, diarrhea, vomiting, something like that. And a lot of it is because these are bitter herbs. And when you're using bitter herbs, like for medicine, you don't use much. And, but people don't know that. They think drink a whole cup and then they get nauseous or throw up or whatever. So as we teach about wild edible plants, there are some rules and things that you need to keep in mind so that you need to be safe. We entitled it um, Identify, Harvest, and Eat. You have to know these wild edible plants. You have to know when to harvest them. You have to know every season of the year there are wild edible plants to eat. Now, we're going into the fall of the year. There's not going to be as much, but there's still plenty of food out there. It's not going to be the same type as what you'll find in the spring and summer. In the fall and winter months, you're going to find things like nuts, berries, roots. You're going to have to maybe dig a little deeper to get them. You may have to, you definitely have to learn to identify these berries. There are certain uh, berries out there that you know, like grapes, we know grapes, but there's wild grapes. Wild grapes don't taste exactly the same as, say, Walmart grapes or, you know, the grocery <laughs> store, but you can do things to them. So what we teach is we teach people how to identify foods every season of the year, not just identify when to harvest it, not just harvest it, what part of the plant to eat. 
because these wild plants, sometimes you can eat the whole plant, like the dandelion, the clover, the violet, some of these plants that most of us see or know or cut down. Then there are certain plants that you can only eat the flowers or only the leaves or only the roots. So these are the things that we teach when we um, do our seminars on the weekend. What we want to do now is go through some of the rules and regulations and learn about wild edible plants. And keep in mind what we're going to show you are common plants because there's, you know, we're in what, Tennessee? Yeah, we've been to California, uh, Arkansas, North Carolina. In California, they have the same plants here that we have here, wild edibles, but they have an additional amount of different type of plants. But they still have the clover, the dandelion, and some of the other plants, but the difference is they're much bigger there. Here, you know, and, and I was shocked when we went there earlier this year, what we have as cute little shrubs here, they're trees over there, okay? And, uh, you know, they last all year long. So just about anywhere you go in the world, the wild common plants that you're gonna see are everywhere. We were even asked to go to Australia, and so they, you know, I got a call and they said, well, do you know the wild edible plants here in Australia? And I said, well, if I don't, I'll find out. And so I, you know, found a book and it said, Wild Edible Plants of Australia. Well, when I got the book through the mail, I was so disappointed because every last plant in there, and it was about 24, were the exact same things we have here. <laughs> the plantain, the clover, the dandelion. Now, like I said, they will have some different ones too, but they sent me basically what we have here. So these plants are pretty much worldwide. And so what we're going to show you um, is um, what God has given us, everyone, and it's easy to learn if you just take, as my husband said, a couple of plants on the weekend. On Sabbath is a perfect time to go out into your yard or a park, you know, and just identify these plants. Learn it. Study everything you can about it, and then next week do a next do another one. And by the end of the year, 52 weeks, you'll have at least 50 more plants than most people do, because a lot of people, when we share these plants, they are shocked. They are. I thought that was a weed. We poisoned that. <laughs> well, if you look on the internet, a lot of the plants that we've been thinking were weeds, and so they're now suddenly discovering some of the medicinal value, which we're not getting into today. But these plants have been used for years hundreds of years for eating. And uh, by the way, in uh, Councils on Diets and Foods, Ellen White did mention that she ate dandelion greens. Now we see dandelion greens in some of the specialty health food stores now for like uh, $5 a bunch or whatever. And they're growing free in our backyard. So did you want to share that verse in um, Second Kings? We're going to share a verse in, uh, in Second Kings before we go to our PowerPoint. This is dealing with uh, King Hezekiah and the attack from the Assyrians. And uh, in 2 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 29, this is right after Hezekiah had been praying and he asked the Lord to, to bless them. Um, God told, sent word back to Hezekiah, don't worry about the Assyrians. Don't worry about the gardens. He said something new is going to happen. For the next three years, you're going to eat whatever comes up on the ground. And on the third year, you can plant whatever and have fun. So uh, what it says is, is that, um, okay, 29 says, And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves and in the second year that which springeth of the same and in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof so for two whole years what were they eating whatever grew up so now and you know my thing is I tell you to eat more grass in a minute um, for those of you who think Nebuchadnezzar had a special uh, diet. I got news for you. What does the Bible say? He ate grass. He ate grass. Was he uh, kind of frail after seven years? He was strong as a 
Okay. And his hair grew. His hair grew. And his fingernails grew. Fingernails grew. So <laughs> what what are y'all looking at me like I'm crazy for? <laughs> you talk to the Lord about that, but he did not have a special grass. It was regular grass. Okay? So what? don't think you can't eat grass or you have to eat a certain portion of the grass. And guess what? Y'all have been eating grass all your life. You like corn, don't you? It's a grass. What about rice? Grass. You like wheat, bread? Uh, barley. Barley green. Any, anybody uh, buying barley green? No, don't go there. <laughs> I'm just going to say send me your money. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll supply you all the barley green you want. Just send me your money. Another anyway. text we'd like to share with you is uh, Deuteronomy 20, verse 19. When I first started learning about wild edibles, I was mainly studying the plants, you know, what you find in the grass and the woods and so forth. Uh, in the last couple of years, I started concentrating on the trees, especially a lot of the, what we call shade trees or ornamental trees, um, landscaping trees. A lot of these trees like crepe myrtle, ginkgo that they use mainly for landscaping are edible and highly nutritional. And it was interesting, we found in Deuteronomy something God told the children of Israel. Go ahead. He told the children of Israel, when you go to war, don't grab any tree to make a weapon. Your fruit trees you leave alone. It's food for you. Trees that are not fruit trees or nut trees, you can use that as a battering ram or as a tool for a weapon. So God was re you know, letting his people know that just don't go crazy. You're scared, you see the enemy coming and you just grab up anything to use as a weapon. If it's food, put it down, okay, and pick up the other stuff. Let's, but you got to recognize what's what. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 20, 20 verse, verse 19, 19 uh, and 20. When, you read. Okay. when thou shalt besiege a city a long time in making war against it to take it thou shalt not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them and thou mayest eat of them and thou shalt not cut them down nor the tree of the field is man uh, what's that so the tree of the field is yeah. man's to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which thou knowest, that they be not trees for meat, thou shalt destroy and cut them down. And thou shalt build bulwarks against the city that maketh war with thee until it be subdued. So here's another thing. If you're cold and you see a tree and you cut it down for wood, you might have got rid of your food for the winter. Mm -hmm. So that was just to me another little thing that the Lord was, one, he's concerned about us. Two, he's trying to let us know there's food out there. Learn to identify the food. Learn to identify what trees are edible. And so in our study, in my study of wild edible plants, I'm starting to include trees, and there's so many different types of trees. Uh, Proverbs 27, 25. The hay appeareth, and the green grass showeth itself, and the herbs of the mountain are gathered. Now, this said to me that the children of Israel, they knew when to gather the herbs. They knew that a certain time of year when the green grass was showing and the hay came, that was the time to go up into the mountains and gather the herbs. So we're going to go into... Oops. Not the green. Okay. Um, just a few economical reasons for eating wild edible plants. First of all, studying wild edible plants you want to discover what parts are edible, when to harvest them, and their nutritional value. Then, as you do that, you also discover new, tasty, and free food. Now, there's every single taste out there. You know, we think, okay, everything is going to be bland. It's going to taste like a tree bark or, or just an old green leaf. There's bitter out there. There's sweet. There's salty, and yes, there is bland. There's every taste out there in the wild as there is in the store. You have plants out there that'll taste just like meat. 
you'll have some that tastes just like fish without tweaking the taste, without seasoning it. Seasoning it, it tastes just like that. You want something that tastes like a steak? It's out there. Something like fish? It's out there. Another good reason for studying about wild edible plants is hopefully once you learn about these plants that are growing free in your backyard, you'll stop destroying the dandelions and clovers with chemicals, and you will help to save the environment. Also, you'll be compelled to acknowledge our great and wonderful Creator God and His Son who gave us food in abundance, and it helps our environment. Now, one thing I used to wonder when I first started studying is, Lord, you gave us over, and they're saying 300,000, but I'm sure it was more than that. But why so much food? Why such a great variety? Until I remember, God intended for us to live forever. So, you know, he had so much in abundance because we were supposed to live on and on and on. And even when sin came in, we were still living, what, eight, nine hundred years? We can't even phantom that right now. Okay, number two, as the world emphasizes going green, and that's the new thing now, we'll all have an advantage over others as we focus not just on recycling and saving money, but we'll also focus on, we'll be at the root of survival. And that's one of the three uh, things of survival, food, shelter, and water, food. We will have our food free when others, when I first started doing this, I remember seeing an article in the newspaper uh, this was talking about a country, Sarajevo, and they had a picture. The, the uh, headline said, "People are there's a famine in the city. People are starving." And then it had an older husband and wife, and they were like on the side of the road in the woods a little bit. And it said in that article, "This couple is not starving because they know what to eat." As a teenager, I was so impressed by that. Now they were older to me as a teenager. They looked like grandparents, you know. But I still was like. I want to be like that. I want to know what to eat. And so that's one thing. We'll be ahead of many people because we'll know. Um, I'm not reading it word for word, so I'm just kind of skimming it. Not only will you be learning the edibility of the wild plants, but you'll also discover some of the different common everyday uses for some of these plants. The plants were used, though we're not getting into that aspect of it, but all the plants that we talked about are not only high in nutrition, and higher than anything you can get in the store, but they're also medicine. So that's a whole nother area that we are not going to discuss. And not only that, many of these plants are used like for clothing. So how many of you are familiar with uh, kudzu? Most here in the South know kudzu. Most hate kudzu. It's a but, curse. But kudzu is edible, it's highly nutritional, and they use it for clothing and baskets and furniture. So it's just a matter of us learning this information. The flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. There's a few rules we want to share before we get into the pictures. And uh, number one is never ever use a wild plant that you cannot positively identify, meaning 100%, not 99% sure, but 100. Now, there's not a lot out there that will kill you, but there are some that will make you very sick especially if you eat too much of it. Number two, you have to learn what parts of the plant is good, not just for medicine, but for eating. Number three, know the best time to harvest the wild plants for medicinal use and for eating. Number four, never collect wild plants from a well-traveled, emphasize well-traveled uh, side of the road. That means if traffic is going up and down constantly, if you have a road where you may have a few cars every now and then, that's not considered well-traveled. Always clean wild plants from uncertain water sources. Identify poisonous lookalikes to avoid making a deadly mistake. Get good books on wild edible plants, preferably one with photographs. Study how plants were used in Bible times because guess what? They're still used the same way. The power that God put in these plants the nutritional value, it's still there. Do not harvest when you're going out to harvest plants, whether it's on your land or someone else's who's giving you permission. Make sure you don't harvest more than one third in that area so you can come back and so they can receive themselves. And the last one, learn the basic wild edibility rule for tasting a new plant. Now I'm gonna give that to you and then we're gonna go into our actual pictures. 
And I didn't make this up, okay? This is information I got from years of study, and it's still the same. Do you want to share that? <laughs> I'll let my husband share it. When you come in front of a plant that you think may be edible, you take a small portion, you place it in your mouth. If it's bitter, spit it out. If it's okay, then chew it up and swallow it. Wait eight hours before you try it again. If it did not run you, if it did not cause you to vomit, then cramp your stomach. Cramp your stomach, then you take another little piece. And remember you don't you won't starve in sixteen hours. Go ahead. After that, then you can eat a small portion, probably much bigger than you had. The reason why you're being introduced to a plant that your body's not used to. I'll give you for instance, um, there's a plant called garlic mustard. To some people, it's very strong because it has a mustard garlic taste. Uh, if you're not used to it, it's very, very powerful, very, very strong, and some people can't stomach it. But if you take your time, get used to it, introducing your body to it, because it has more minerals and more vitamins than your collard greens and your spinach, and stuff like that. But that's what happens in the wild. It's not been cultivated, and so it's strong in the properties that it do have. Okay, we're gonna go into some of the wild edible plants. And like I said, these are common. These are not plants that are exotic, that you have to go to another country or something to find. They're found pretty much all over the world. Whoops, that's the wrong way. Okay, we all know the common dandelion. This is one plant that you can eat every single part of it, from the flower, to the stems, to the leaves, even to the root. And most of us have this. Now, I remember studying that in the fall, which we're, well, we are in the fall of the year, Native Americans used to actually go on dandelion hunts because of the value of this plant, because it had such great nutritional value, especially in the fall, it gave them extra energy. So they would go on dandelion hunts, and you know this time of year, you're not gonna see the flowers, but you can still see the leaves. So it's still a good time to get the leaves. And when I say pot herb, that merely means putting a wild plant in a pot and cooking it like you would greens. And so in this time of year, this is what you wanna do, is use it as a pot herb, meaning you wanna cook it, because it'll probably be a little bit more bitter. If you get this plant in the spring of the year, before it flowers, it's gonna be more mild tasting, and then you can use it in a salad. But the flowers in the spring, you can take them and put them in your salads and uh, eat them raw. Here's the common violet. Most of us have seen this. Again, you're not gonna see the flower this time of year, but there's plenty of violets. You notice the heart-shaped leaf there? These violets are high in vitamin C. And even though the flower, which a lot of people make a, a, a violet candy out of the purple flowers, those are edible, but even when the flower is gone, you can still use the leaves. Some people will take the leaves of the common violet and put it in their sandwich in place of lettuce. Again, they're high in vitamin C, and I see this all over the place even now. The violet leaves will last up until, uh, even into January in the south, here in the southeast. Okay, here's the clover. Now you know there's many different types of clover. There's the crimson, which is the red one here. The red clover is that pink one. Even though it's pink, that's what they call the red clover. Then there's the white clover, the yellow clover. All the clovers are edible. And every part of the clover plant is edible. The leaf, the stem, the sh um, flowers, every part. Now again, remember, all these plants have different tastes to them as well. Now, there's a little bit of this left, Queen Anne's Lace. The other name for this plant is wild carrot. And just as a side note, most wild plants, depending upon what part of the country you're in, meaning north, south, east, or west, may have several different common names. One of the common names is Queen Anne's Lace. Another one is wild carrot. And uh, I've seen a few out. Even today, as we were coming here, there's still some on the side of the road. Again, 
You can use the flower, the stem, and this is actually the original carrot. Just so you know, the original carrot was not orange. The original carrots were what you see labeled as exotic now in the uh, specialty stores. There were, there were uh, green, white. purple, white or off-white, black. Um, black. It was not originally orange. And that's a whole other story. You can check online the Carrot Museum. It'll give you all the information you need. But this is the original carrot, Queen Anne's Lace. And they're still out now. And if you take it and smell it, yeah, they're still out, not in abundance, but I've seen them up and down the road still, and they're still flowering. They smell just like a carrot, too. If you pull up the root, you'll see a small, depending on how big the plant is, little uh, root on it, which is kind of like, looks like a parsnip. So this, this was uh, the original, or the carrot we eat now was developed from this wild carrot here. Yeah, how they made it grow bigger was they would snip off the flowers. Okay, the rose. Cut a certain level and then it keeps growing. We all know the rose, any kind of rose is edible. The petals are edible. We had some today in the salad. Um, now they have what they call rose hips. When the roses die, whether these are wild roses or roses that you grow for beauty, when the roses die, a little seed pod is going to develop. On your left, you can see the seed, little red berries, sometimes they're orange, but those uh, hips, that's what they call them, are so high in vitamin C, you can just have a handful of those hips in your hand, and it's more vitamin C than 60 oranges. Yes. So this is a good herb to have, or plant to have, the berries to have uh, around the flu season. But um, if you ever go to like a drugstore and you'll see, you know, you're looking for vitamin C capsules, sometimes it'll say with rose hips. This is what it's talking about, those berries. And the best time to get them, even though they're starting to come on the trees and bushes now, is after the first frost. They actually have a taste like, um, um, like an orange. Citrus. Okay. Citrusy, okay. Here's mullen. Mullen is uh, out also right now. This is a plant that loves, as you see, rocky, dry areas. Now this one is used mainly as a tea, but uh, it can grow almost anywhere. And these plants can get up to, well, we had one last year about, was almost, it was tall as a house, about 12 feet, if it has the right conditions. And it has little f yellow flowers on it that develop the second year. Mullen. Plantain. Plantain is something that is just about in everybody's yard, whether you know it or not. Even if you have the best grass, maybe you pulled it out, but it was there. I made a, a pot herb out of this, and people swore it was collard greens. It doesn't have a bitter taste. Um, it, it really did taste like collard greens. And um, there's a broad leaf, and then there's a narrow leaf plantain. And uh, medicinally, it's off the chain. Again, that's not a subject we're discussing today. Here's a narrow leaf plantain. You see the difference? We'll go back a little bit. Okay, the broad leaf, of course, they're, they're wider. And then the narrow leaf, and you see on the, uh, the left there are the little seed pods. Okay. All right, this is out right now. I see this up and down the road, and if you are going up and down, just look on the side of the road. You'll see that bush, that red bush, uh, I mean, red little cluster of berries. That's sumac. Sumac, I know some of you have heard of poison sumac. The berries are white. That's the difference, so you don't have to worry. And I have not seen the poison sumac in this area. It grows mostly in the north. And um, this sumac is the smooth sumac. There's also a staghorn sumac in this area, and there's a winged sumac. So there's three different kinds, and all of them are very high in vitamin C. Another name for sumac in this area is wild lemonade, because they do taste like lemonade. It has a bitter, sweet, lemony taste. And um, this is the time of year, actually, the fall, for the smooth sumac. They're ripe now. They're good now. The winged sumac came out. It was ripe uh, maybe about a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. So you have to know what time to harvest it, because if you harvest this too late, it will have no taste. It'll be totally bland. So you need to get it at the right time. Milkweed. Now, there's a few of these left, but I'm showing you the four different parts of the milkweed plant. Every part is edible, and the flower, which is right there, 
That is one of the most exotic, delicious tasting wild plants I have ever tasted. And you have to get it at a certain time. You have to harvest it in the morning while the dew is still on it. And then you have to take it back to the house and make a tea out of it and drink it right away. I did that exactly as the instructions said, and it was delicious. Decided to save some for the next day, you know, to see if I could get that same taste. It didn't taste the same. It was good, but it lost that special exotic flavor. Then we have right here, this is called the broccoli part of the milkweed. It tastes just like broccoli. And right here is the seed pot. We made something called pot filet. It actually tastes like fish when you season it right. So the milkweed, all parts of this plant is edible. And the leaves, you see the leaves there? The leaves are thick, almost like cabbage. And you can make uh, like a stuffed cabbage, wild milkweed dish. <laughs> so this is a plant that is edible. And it's out right now. The stage you'll find this in is, whoops. Let's go back. The stage that this is in right now is this stage. The pod should be out. The flowers are gone. You may see a few flowers. You may see a few of those, but for the most part, you're going to see the seed pods. And that's the part that you can eat also. All right, yucca. Many of us have seen yucca, have heard of yucca, but maybe we didn't realize yucca has delicious tasting flowers. I tasted them for the first time last year, and I'm telling you, they taste kind of like cucumbers. They have a very mild cucumbery taste. And uh, if you've ever, maybe you didn't notice, but next time you see yucca, you'll see this usually around um, July, you know, and you'll see, the, usually they have several flowers, like you see right here, several flowers. You just pull them off the plant, take them home, put them in a plastic bag in your refrigerator until you're ready to either put them in your salad or stir fry them. They don't need to be cooked. They're not bitter at all. They just, like I said, taste kind of like a cucumber. I'll get the hang of this. Okay, there we go. Daylilies. We see these. They, many of them have escaped and are growing on the side of the road. That's why I included this one. But yes, these are edible. You can eat the flowers. You can eat the stem. And before the flowers develop, there's a little, you know, the bud. That's supposed to be really delicious. So the daylily is edible and nutritional. And here we have amaranth. Now, a lot of times people get this in their gardens, and you just take it and destroy it because you think it's a horrible weed. In the islands, this is called Kalaloo. And it is a <laughs> nutritional, wild, edible plant, very high in nutritional value. And it has different colors. There's a red one. There's also a thornless one. And then there's one that has thorns. So this one, cal I, mean, well, I say Kalaloo, but amaranth is what we call it here. It grows wild, uninhibited, and it's highly nutritional. Elderberries. This is my, one of my favorite plants. This is how you're going to see it in uh, late spring, early summer. You're going to see these big white heads of, of flowers. Then you, after the flower, you'll see the berries, which will be green initially. And then this is where they are right now, this dark purple. Some are even darker than that. That's when you want to harvest them. Now you can also use the flowers and use those in salads, but you can make a syrup out of these berries. And there, a lot of people make syrups or jelly. This is excellent for this time of year, especially for colds and flus, but they're also delicious and kids love it. High in vitamin C and so many other nutrients. Sheep sorrel. Now this is something that usually you'll find in the grass low growing. You'll have to kind of get what we call um, up close and personal because this is a low growing plant. But if you look right here, you can see the leaves have like little wings on them right there. Is another one. That's the way you can identify sheep sorrel. It tastes lemony. It's thick like, um, almost like reminds me of a succulent. And it, it's a very mild tasting. This would be considered a trail nibble, meaning you can just pick it while you're out hiking or something and just eat it. It has a very kind of sweet lemony taste to it. Ah, ginkgo. Now, a lot of people see the fruit of ginkgo, and they, all they think about is how it smells so bad. 
And I have to agree, it does have kind of a bad smell, but sour cheese. Last year, for the first time, we discovered how to prepare the ginkgo fr uh, fruit. Oops. Right here, if you go right here, this is when they're ripe, usually when they fall on the ground. They have an orange, uh, almost sherbet looking color to them, and they're wrinkled. That's when they're ripe. When they're in a tree like this, they're not ripe. Even if they're orange, they're not ripe. Once they fall to the ground, they're good and ripe. Yes, they do have a bad smell, but all you have to do, take off that soft, wet, wrinkly skin, and there's a little nut in there, which looks like um, an almond, kind of. You, in that nut, you put it in a, in a pot, and I'm giving you a quick way, but you put it in a, a, a skillet, stir fry in a little oil, and it will literally start popping like popcorn. And let me tell you, what comes out is a beautiful little green emerald. It looks like, um, it's about the size of a lima bean, but shaped more oval and it's delicious. Doesn't smell anything like the, the um, skin that you took off of it. it. It totally has a different taste. And we just picked up, in fact, I just harvested about 400 little fruit the other day because we have several more seminars to do and I demonstrate in the seminars how to uh, process it. But um, ginkgo, it has so many nutritional um, benefits to it. You want to, don't let the fruit go to rot anymore. Learn how to harvest it. Utilize all that vitamins and, and so forth that God has given us. Oh boy. Okay, lamb's quarters is, is coming out right now if you don't already have it. One of the ways you can tell, identify this if you look here at the leaves, at the tips of them, even here, this is a young one, this is an older one. It has kind of a dusty white color to it. This is also a highly nutritional plant. One plant can have over 70,000 seeds on it. And th those seeds are edible too. You can use it like for a meal. And the leaves also can be used, uh, if you like the taste, they can be used in your salads. Or you can use the leaves, um, cook them. Now they, they really dwindle down once you cook them. And another name for lamb's quarters is uh, wild spinach. So it's highly nutritional. Got it. Nodding thistle. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is something you see usually in the early spring. You see that thorny? Everybody knows that. Well, guess what? If you take a knife, scrape off all those thorns, and remember, do it before it flowers, even though it's still edible after, but you'll have to cook it. Scrape off all those thorns and then chop it up. It tastes like celery. Sweet. A sweet celery, better than the store-bought celery. If you get it after it flowers, it's going to still have that taste. It's just going to be a little uh, tougher and stronger. So you want to cook it. As a general rule, most wild edible plants are going to be milder tasting if you get them before they flower. That's a general rule, OK? And here's our little periwinkle, which some of you have it as just landscape and it kind of takes over. Yes, it's edible and it's delicious and it's used year round. That was periwinkle. Garlic mustard, my husband mentioned that earlier. This grows year round also. This is the, the stage it's in in the spring, it flowers, but after that, in the fall and the winter, it's still growing. It's growing more like a clump. And it, if you like mustard greens or if you like garlic, you'll love this plant. And it's also very high in nutritional value. May apple. You see that little fruit over there? That Not fruit, but a flower. Wow. After that flower dies, a little, um, no bigger than a plum or even smaller than that, develops. And that's the part that is edible on this plant. They say it tastes similar to kind of like a sour apple. When we were rangers, um, we barely got them because the deer loved them. But if you can get them, they do taste, you know, they're edible, and they just have a kind of a bitter taste. And here's our kudzu. For those who wanted to know, yes, kudzu is edible. And it's nutritional. You can cook it, make a pot herb. You can use it if you get it early. Oh, yeah. Get it early. You can use the leaves and you sell it. And the flower here, you see that purple flower? It is delicious as a jelly. It's one of the favorite uh, wild jams out there. But you see how it takes over? Now you know if it's taking over your land, start eating it. 
Or if you and that is it. He has made everything beautiful in his time. This was just a smidgen, a little drop in the bucket of plants. These were mostly, these were, well, some were spring, some were summer, some were fall. But <coughs> this is just, like I said, a, a small portion of the different plants. As we're going into the winter and the fall, there's roots, there's berries, and uh, you just have to learn to identify them and uh, learn how to cook them and prepare them and when to harvest them. So we're going to uh, take a moment now. We hope we've whet your appetite to start identifying what you have out in the wild. And uh, not just identifying, but start utilizing it maybe a few a week until you get used to the taste. Okay, we're going to have prayer and, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Okay, let's, let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father and loving Lord, we want to thank you so much. Lord, you have provided for us from the very beginning of Earth's history. Lord, and nothing has changed for you. Lord, re-educate us. Help us to go out into our yards and um, fields and learn the plants that you have provided for us for food. Um, when we're not able to buy nor sell, dear Lord, you still have food prepared for your people. So bless us now, keep us in the hall of thy love, and continue to bless the programming that follows. Amen. Amen.